12 hours GMT in Accra. Very good afternoon to you. This is Midday Live and we're coming to you from our news hub here at Addis Ababa in Accra. My name is Nanikia Mensah Bampa and coming up this afternoon. Head teacher at the center of the Birman Eduman DA Basic School sex video scandal relieved of his post this afternoon and we will speak with Will Duff on the worrying trend. Also, Wa Polytechnic in Upper East Region to be named after former President Dr. Hila Liman. That is the Upper West Region. And coming up on the foreign front, head of DR Congo's Catholic Church says his country is becoming like a prison. Right, so we have the detail of these and other stories, plus the latest in sports and business coming up in the next hour. Uh, stay with us. And beginning with this afternoon, Foreign Minister has been briefing uh, the media there. Well, we'll be bringing you that particular story in a bit, but let's move on to some other stories this afternoon. The five-member ad hoc committee probing the cash for seat saga on Tuesday met with the expatriates business community in Kamra. Spokesperson for the committee, Yao Boabinya Samoa, told my colleague Evelyn Tingma that the deliberations were fruitful. In continuation of the process that we've started already, uh, we have been interviewing persons associated with the process that the House set up the committee to investigate. And uh, part of the reasons uh, uh, we needed to meet the expatriate community was that some of them had been cited as having paid monies for, for, for seats, as it were, to sit close to the president. There was a specific allegation, uh, even though uh, the allegation appears to have changed somewhat. Once we got onto the floor of the House, the motion we are investigating would appear to be slightly different. But we needed to meet the expatriate community anyway, because they are central to the process. Happily, yesterday, several of them turned up, and uh, we had a very fruitful meeting uh, analyzing the situation with them. And uh, we believe that very soon we'll come to the end of the sittings proper and then we'll deliver our reports to the House. So the first time you invited them, they failed to turn up. Did they give you reasons why they didn't turn up the first time? We've gone over that. I, I, I think we've moved beyond that. And I gave the first time that happened when we had to postpone the sitting. I believe I gave adequate reason for that. So it wasn't part of our discussions yesterday. The, the discussion you said was fruitful yesterday. Um, can you give us a gist of what actually um, they told you or anything? Absolutely not. Everything will be in our report. And I'm sure the, benef the media and the people of Ghana will have the full benefit of the report once the report is out. But yesterday was a sitting in camera. It's out of public view. And they've been very fruitful. It's been, it was fruitful. They were frank. We had frank discussions. Uh, they gave us all the information necessary, and I believe the members of the committee were very satisfied. Right. Um, now, the committee has been given one week to present a report to Parliament. Initially, you were supposed to present the report today, but now you have one week more to do so. Um, are you ready to present it next week? It is my hope and belief that the report will be ready. We are working diligently. We have a very good staff helping us. Members of the committee are ready to perform. I believe it will be ready. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have been speaking with Onwabo Yaobo Abeng Asamoa, who is a spokesperson for the five-member committee that has been set up to probe the cash for seats saga. He is also a member of parliament for Adenta constituency. From Parliament House, I'm Evelyn Tinkma. Well, I said my colleague Evelyn Tingma there with that one on the cash for seat saga. Let's move away from Parliament now to matters on security. And five police officers have been killed in line of duty between January 1 and 21 this year. Peter Kwawadato looks at the worrying trend in the following report. The country is getting increasingly worried over the speed of targeted killing of security personnel. Public concerns heightened following the record killings of five police personnel within the first three weeks of the new year. Two of the incidents occurred in the Ashanti region, with one each in the Greater Accra, Central and Western regions. 
first was the death of an inspector and a constable at Dobunso in the Sechra from Plains of the Ashanti region. The two died protecting the public from criminal elements. Another policeman was also shot dead at a nine checkpoint duty in the central region just about the same time. The fourth incident happened in the western region where a policeman who was attempting to save the life of another person also died in a fatal accident. The Sunday dawn killing of Inspector Emmanuel Selevi at the Kwabenya police station brought to five the number of policemen lost within the first three weeks of this year. Already this number is half of similar deaths recorded by the police in 2017. Five of those deaths occurred through adversarial or combative action, with the rest not through combative action. Aside the five deaths recorded in the first three weeks of this year was the ambushing of the three military men and a police officer at Agogo a few days ago. This was a clear indication that the military is not left out in the growing attack on security men. The Public Affairs Directorate of the Ghana Armed Forces admitted they are a target but declined to give details for fear of causing fear and panic among the personnel. Right, I'll be bringing you more to this particular one, talking about the police officers and what is being done to ensure that these incidents do not reoccur. But let's move away and uh, we go to Azizanya, where fisher folk in that area say they will fight illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing activities in the absence of the state task force. Bad fishing practices have reportedly bounced back following the recall of the fisheries task force. The Fisheries Task Force was instituted by the Fisheries and Aquaculture Development Ministry last year to enforce the fisheries laws. The decision came after wide consultations on the effect of illegal and unregulated fishing practices in the fishing industry. Even though the task force approach was met with stiff opposition, mostly from the Greater Accra region, those who embraced the idea went ahead with implementation with full backing from the ministry. And the effort appeared to have been yielding dividends. For a few months, the industry was improving. Every fisherman beats his chest after hard days and nights nice work at sea. The women were equally happy because they get what they want from the landing beach. But uh, there was a sudden U-turn. The ministry, perhaps unable to stand the pressure, asked the task force to suspend its operations, giving room for the illegal fishing practices. There was no uh, fish activities. So it is affecting the fishes and even we, the human beings, because we, we, we don't get the fish to catch. And because of the suspension, uh, the other communities get the opportunity and they were practicing uh, the illegal fishing. We want the government to come in quickly. Responding to the issue, Deputy Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture Development, Francis Kinsley Atukujo, denied knowledge of any such directive to suspend the task force. Because I know we have the Fisheries Enforcement Unit that is working. It's a unit that, we, that is working with ourselves, uh, the, the Navy, EPA, Marine Police, a lot of the, uh, organizations are there. It is working. What you probably are talking about, uh, uh, the Fisheries World Volunteers, which are official volunteer organizations. So we'll but we'll find, find out, we'll go, because even this year we want to expand. So how should we suspend? The fisher folk in Azizanya, who have long been against illegal fishing, is prevailing on government to sanitize the industry. You're watching Midday Live on TV3 and we're going to one of our developing stories where the head teacher in the center of the Breman Eduman DA Basic School sex video scandal has reportedly been relieved of his post. Robert Sepe has also been directed to meet a two-man disciplinary committee for the appropriate disciplinary actions and the decision was taken by the Ghana Education Service after separate meetings with the lady in question, a final year student of Odobin Senior High School and the, the teacher. Now, 
This is not the first time that teachers who are to take care of pupils have taken advantage to have sex with them. I have been joined via phone by Patricia Isabella Esel, the program manager in charge of access to justice and prevention of violence against women, girls, other women in law and development in Africa. Well done. Good afternoon to you, madam, and we're grateful for your time this afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, can Wildaf say on record that teachers are sleeping with pupils, uh, they are trained, they are, they are to train and to teach? Okay, thank you very much. Um, per the report that we've been getting from various organizations, including organizations like PLAN, and then I remember there was a time that there was a huge survey somewhere in the central region that gave out that um, a lot of the numbers of students who got pregnant were impregnated by their teachers. And then um, on the basis of plans um, research, I think in 2010 or 12, also came out with the fact that out of the 100 um, surveyed people, 53 out of them were engaged sexually by their teachers. And for me, this is very worrying um, and an act that should be condemned in its totality. We know that we give our children out to go to school for these teachers to um, teach them and not to have even um, any kind of sexual relationship with them. I also understand that GES, that's Ghana Education Service Code of um, Ethics or Conduct, and their policies um, frowned on the fact that there should be no um, sexual relationship whatsoever between a teacher and um, a student. So if we hear such things, um, for me, it's very worrying. It's something that we don't have to take on a lighter note, or we don't have to discuss it once and then leave it to die. But it's something mm. that we need to take it up from various angles and to ensure that it does not repeat itself anywhere whatsoever. Now, tell us, what can parents, uh, as well as your organization, do to ensure this trend does not continue? I think what we can do as an organization, for World Up, we have started the work already because we believe in prevention rather than response. Because once you prevent the occurrence, you spend less money on that than to wait until it happens and then you have to respond or uh, mitigate that. So for us, we have what we call the Girls Empowerment um, Clubs or um, safe space for girls within the school setting, mm -hmm. where young girls between the ages of 10 and, and 16 are taking through different types of um, engagement and knowledge building on sexual abuse, domestic violence, and internet safety. Because now a lot of our girls are sexually active at very tender age, they have access to uh, mobile phones, they have access to internet mm. and other kinds of communications that parents are not aware of. So we try to let them know the implications of getting yourself involved in this. I'm sure this young lady in question here, if she knew the implications, she would first of all not have allowed the video to have been taken, mm. even if she had given her consent. Now, Patricia... Patricia, mm -hmm. now, yes, now, now let's look at the current sex tape of the head teacher in Eduman going viral with some Ghanaians, especially women. When you visit social media, you mm -hmm. see them undertaking a challenge known as the stool challenge, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. Are you worried? It is worrying because now we are not even condemning the act, but rather perpetrating what we call the culture um, the rape culture, where we seem to normalize some of these things, and then in the media or social spaces, they become like normal. And then some, I've seen, I've seen a couple of questions where some are even started um, blaming the victim, that is the the lady in question, for doing that instead of condemning the act from happening in the first place. I'm not too sure of the age of the girl. So I can't say whether, let's assume if, it's, if she's below 
16, then that is a very huge crime. That is totally defilement. Whether she agreed or not, the man has to be taken on. But for me, this act should not, children should not allow, or even a married couple should not allow their sex scenes or engagement to be recorded. Because right. you might not even know when your phone is stolen or okay. when you loosely leave your, your chip somewhere. Okay. Somebody we, 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 we are not too, we are not too sure... We are not too sure of her age, whether it's 17, 18, 19, but I'm sure we'll be getting the exact age and communicating. But Patricia, we are grateful for your time this afternoon. Patricia Isabella Isel is the program's manager in charge of access to justice and prevention of violence against women and girls at Women in Law and Development in Africa World of sharing her thoughts on the current issue at hand, talking about that sex videotape of a head teacher and a student at Eduman. Uh, we'll be getting you more detail to that particular one in our subsequent bulletins but away from that now newly elected executives of the colleges of education teachers association of ghana uh, have served notice to embark on a year-long strike if government fails to grant members markets premium now the association has issued a three-month ultimatum to government to address their grievances ibrahim abubakar has this report CTAC says the era of discriminating against their members won't be tolerated again. The association claims both past and present governments have denied their members the opportunity to access market premium package even though they have been upgraded to tertiary status. President-elect of CTAG, Prince Obey Himan, warned that members are ready to go on strike for a year or more if government fails to open negotiation with them. Enough is enough. We will no longer agree to this kind of second class treatment to our members as if we were second class, uh, you know, teachers in the tertiary dispensation. In Ghana here, the law says that every teacher that teaches in a tertiary education institution give him market premium. That is why all teachers in all the public tertiary institutions go home with this uh, market premium at the end of the day. So you cannot continuously deny us. Secretary for the Association, Nathan Ohinijan, pleaded with the government not to push them to embark on industrial action. Now the colleges happen to be part of the tertiary fraternity. And these are allowances that cushion them to enjoy and to motivate them to do other things that a student needs to also uh, improve upon their professional development. So we press upon the government to listen to us, at least uh, call for negotiations on these things. Right, and we're going back to the floor of Parliament, where a foreign minister has been briefing Parliament on the status of the two ex-Guantanamo Bay detainees and she told Parliament that there was no exit plan in the agreement signed by the John Mahama led administration. On Tuesday the minority asked the government to make known to them what really uh, the decision would be on the two former Guantanamo Bay detainees and Evelyn Tingma is our parliamentary correspondent. She joins us now. January 2016 the two ex-detainees now with families have been living here and so far are reported to be of good behavior. Mr. Speaker, on 6 January 2018, the bilateral cooperation concerning the resettlement of the two came to an end. This was confirmed in a meeting with the U.S. Ambassador, Ambassador Jackson, on the 10th of January 2018. He confirmed that U.S. financial support and obligation in respect of the agreement had ended following its expiration. However, it was agreed at the meeting that continued cooperation in terms of security and mutual exchange of information and intelligence on the activities of the two and all their associates was essential. Ambassador Jackson expressed his openness to discuss any post-6 January arrangements and to carry forward same to the State Department for consideration. 
It is to be noted that no exit arrangements were originally discussed between the two governments to end the bilateral arrangements at the time of negotiation. The U.S. has also been clear in our discussions with them that per the agreement, returning them to the United States is not an option open to discussion or negotiation. This means that all obligations relating to the two subjects has now become the responsibility of Ghana. Right, so we just heard the foreign minister there on the floor of parliament addressing the status of the two ex-Guantanamo Bay detainees. And my colleague Evelyn Tingma joins us on the phone lines now to pick uh, reactions of the minority on this particular one after she gave out that uh, decision there. Right, so Evelyn, good afternoon and thanks for joining us on Midday Live. Hello, Nanika. Now, what is the minority saying after the foreign minister spoke on the floor of parliament? Lanikia, um, the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, who is Samuel Okijita Blakwa, and from the minority side, um, wanted some clarification. And the clarification he is asking is that uh, the minister, he's asking the minister to tell the House that at the time that government was presenting the agreement to Parliament for ratification, was there no still a discussion on the exit strategy? And he also argues that if the minister says the two have attained refugee status, and he wants to know when that refugee status will expire, since the laws of Ghana status is not permanent. Well, Honorable Ayariga um, also um, argued that um, it was refreshing to note that the two have not established a terrorist as was suggested in the past by the NPC. And so basically the minority, they are kind of... Um, ending uh, the, 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 the status of the two people and that the, the, their government or maybe they do anything wrong. But the minority, the majority, and uh, what they are arguing is that the, the agreement that was signed by the previous government was an illegality. And basically, that is the argument the two um, sides are making in the house. One is saying there was an illegality somewhere, and the two and the minority. Fine. The minister is saying that and the two were of good behavior in the country, and so there was nothing wrong that the previous government did. And so basically that is the argument here. In well, I thank you for that update, Evelyn Tingma, my colleague there on the f at Parliament House, bringing us up to speed with happenings there, uh, looking at reactions from the minority after the foreign minister announced the status of the two uh, Guantanamo Ex Guantanamo Bay detainees. There, we're taking a breather. When we return, there's more on Midday Live. Stay with us. We're grateful for your time. This is Midday Live, and uh, we are looking at one of our developing stories. And in the Asante Achim North, in the Ashanti region, has been able to flash out almost half of the over 45,000 cattle at Agogo and its surrounding areas. Now, reports suggest nomadic headsmen fleeing Agogo are reportedly moving to the citrus central district of that region. Now, they are moving to areas such as in Suta, Asereso, and Trodo. Nkodia from so among others now and we would want to engage DSP Charles Etuya who is the Nsuta police commander. Good afternoon to you DSP and we are grateful for your time. Good afternoon madam. Now the last conversation we had with you on Saturday you said that the headsmen and the cattle had moved to the central district in the Ashanti region. What is the situation now? Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much, madam, and uh, thank you very much to your viewers as well for giving me this time. Uh, yeah, last time, as I reported, for now, I can tell you the number has reduced drastically. It's like they have passed through our end towards Ejra and uh, uh, a direction. 
Now, the farmers don't give us too much report as it was earlier on uh, given. So we, we hope it will continue this way by means of uh, getting out of the system. So I can tell you for now, the number has reduced. It has reduced to, to about how much? There was a figure about over 45,000 cattle at Agogo and it's surrounding. How many or how much has it reduced to? Uh, to be frank, I can't best give you the specific number. But in percentages wise. The 45,000 people came to our end here. Some went to Drobonso, some went to Kumawu, others to uh, 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 Donkokum areas. Mm. But we, the few ones that we uh, 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 met them here, but I can tell you, the normal wasn't up to that 45,000. But mm. it will range about uh, maybe 10,000 plus. Anyway. Okay, okay. Now, but most of them have passed through to uh, Edra and uh, Atibubu mm. direction. Right. Now, another key thing would be the safety of the resident as well as the headsman. I asked the other time and I'm asking again, what is being done to ensure their safety? Yeah, in fact, the... The security, so far as we are concerned, have given the farmers assurance and the full protection. By means of, we have advised them to report any incident of maybe causing damage to their crops by this uh, cattle to us, to enable us, we be the front uh, people to approach this full and We don't want to leave it in the hands of they, the farmers, to take the law into their own hands. So that is the advice we've given it to them. And also, those uh, nomadics who are passing, we give them the protection of getting out of the area safely because they, they can't locate themselves in anybody's farm in this district. So we give them protection by means of any, not uh, allowing any of our resident farmers to be attacking them. Right. We are grateful for your time. Uh, DSP Charles Etia is the Insuta Police Commander speaking on the nomadics at Agogo and matters arising. Away from that, the need for an increase in centers of excellence in Ghana has become necessary to help prevent medical tourism. Now, the increase in medical tourism would enable the country to train more specialist doctors to treat all kinds of medical conditions. Vice President Dr. Baumier's departure from Ghana to the United Kingdom on medical leave has reignited a debate on why some Ghanaian leaders travel outside for medical care. Adakulu Member of Parliament Kwame Agbuja expressed his concern on the matter. Would they be protecting public pests to have flown the Vice President out of the country when we could have done that? Uh, uh, assess or giving him treatment at Ridge or within the country. However, a Deputy Health Minister, Kinsley Abwaji Jidu, had explained the decision to fly the Vice President to the UK. We had Ghanaian doctors looking after him on the Thursday and Friday, but they, upon their advice, that he had to seek the medical care outside the country. But and of which condition would doctors advise that a patient be taken outside Ghana for medical attention? If the service being rendered or being sought is not available here, and this may be that the expertise, um, the human resource may be here, but the equipment may not be here, or the other ancillary services required for even to complete the diagnosis may not be here. In that case, then, uh, or there's an expertise, maybe a world-renowned um, specialist in a particular field which is not developed here, then the person will need that kind of service outside. So for an ordinary person, what will happen is that a medical board is usually set up to evaluate the diagnosis and indeed confirm that the service that is being sought is not available here or um, there is either a better expertise elsewhere and that's the best place that the person can get that care. Then that board certifies it and then if the employers are willing, they provide um, some financial help and stuff like that to get the person out. Dr. Bayo explained that though Ghana has a lot of specialist doctors and equipment, Ghanaians would continue to travel outside for medical care since not all specialists are found in Ghana. In case of organ transplant, for example, a patient would definitely need the expertise of doctors abroad. Therefore, the need for an increase in centers of excellence. Fetal therapy, for instance, 
where we perform surgeries for babies while they are inside their mother's womb. It's a skill that can easily be linked, but the equipment needed to have that kind of service available currently is not available. Private centers have in, um, invested and are able to do a lot of fetal diagnostics now, but the therapy to a large extent, in, in utero surgeries and stuff, are not being performed in the country. We've been able to set up a center like the cardiothoracic center, and we are doing heart surgeries. Before it came, there were Ghanaian heart surgeons, but they couldn't come here because when they come, where are they going to operate? That's why we as a nation must set up centers of excellence where we can go into these subspecialties and it is available for training. He explained most Ghanaian doctors are unable to return to Ghana for practice due to the lack of equipment in the area of their expertise. He stated the association wish the country had all the necessary machinery and expertise to attract other heads of state to seek medical care in Ghana. On to one of our headline stories now, and the president, Ikufuado, has disclosed that while Polytechnic in the Upper West Region will be named after former president, Dr. Hilaliman, speaking at the 20th anniversary remembrance celebration of the late diplomats, the president said Dr. Liman carried an image of decent, honest, and was a patriotic leader. <laughs> Dr. Hilal Iman became the president of the Third Republic in 1979. He was, however, overthrown shortly through a coup d'etat in 1981 by the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, AFRC, led by Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings. Dr. Hilal Iman subsequently founded the PNC and contested on the ticket of the party in the 1992 presidential elections. <laughs> 20th anniversary remembrance celebration was attended by a cross-section of Ghanaians including members of the Council of State, traditional leaders, family members and government officials. The event was mainly used to reflect on Dr. Liman's life as a scholar, diplomat, statesman, father and husband. Our interaction was limited to letters. However, as fate will have it, we finally met in person for the first time at Legon when I was attending the New Year School. For a scholar at heart, I guess there was no better place for him to summon the courage and the inspiration to start wooing me. As they say, one thing led to another. And obviously, the fact that we are married a while later attests to the fact that my brother was not the only one to benefit from my initial interaction with Hela as a diplomat. President Ekofado announced the War Polytechnic will be named after him. Once the parliamentary process has been completed, the War Polytechnic will thenceforth be called the Hela Liman Polytechnic. A name which will remain with the conversion of the Polytechnic into a technical university. Describing him as a patriotic and selfless leader, President Ikufado said his presidency restored order and stability to the country. Ill-fated as his presidency was, he died with the reputation and memory of a decent, honest, patriotic man who did his best to overcome considerable odds. The event was also to launch the Hila Liman Foundation the to enhance the capacity of the youth to engage in local level democracy building. Mrs. Dora Fulera Liman. His gentle soul continued to rest in peace. This is Midday Live. Return shortly with some sports with Nanaku Jafre. Stay with us.
Good afternoon. Welcome back to Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Dona Kujafre with the sports updates. Let's get into the details now. There is confusion about which venues will host three greater Accra teams in the Ghana Premier League next season with Accra Hats of Folk with Accra Sports Stadium set to undergo major renovation works for the Women's Cup of Nations. Inter-Allies, Accra Hats of Folk and Liberty Professionals are all hoping to use the Accra Sports Stadium as the base for their Ghana Premier League games, but that is in doubt now. Deputy Sports Minister Pius Hajide confirmed to TV3 Sports that Accra Hats of Folk have known, for instance, since the end of last season that the stadium will be closed down at some point for renovation works depending on the contractor. Hats meanwhile say they have never been told exactly when or how the closure will happen. Hakman Edu is a club's administrative manager. The uh, position of the uh, sports ministry was that it's true they were going to close down the stadium, but not the entire stadium. They just wanted to do renovation at the VIP stand, so they were going to do the work phase by phase, meaning that we could still use the park and the popular stand uh, for our matches as they also do their work at the VIP side. When there is the need for them to come to the, uh, the popular stand as well, they would let us know. And for up to now, uh, nobody has given us anywhere that, you no, know, uh, maybe you can't even use the facility because of this or that. Uh, we just been hearing from the uh, radio stations and the social media that the stadium is going to be closed down. So, uh, really, we are hearing the rumor, but there is no official notification uh, as to the authenticity of this uh, information. Inter allies are hoping to switch venues to the Accra Sports Stadium as are Liberty professionals, but both clubs say they are unaware of any closure of major renovation works that would affect that. With the Ministry of Youth and Sports insisting major renovation works are needed for the Nations Cup, there could be major challenges ahead for both clubs. The Tema Stadium and Elwak could be alternative venues, but for Hearts, they could be forced to play their home games in Cape Coast. The implication of such a move for revenue and television coverage of the league are dire. On to our next story in our clubs in Major League Soccer in the United States of America are heading back for preseason as one of the world's fastest growing leagues prepares to spring into action. It is also a league that is increasingly becoming to beginning to attract a lot more talent from Ghana as Yao Ofosulabi reports. It is gradually becoming a favorite league for Ghanaian players from the days of Joado when no one in Ghana particularly cared about the major league soccer. The league has grown to become a destination that attracts some of the brightest and smartest Ghanaian footballers. And after draft weekend, there are new Ghanaian faces to keep up with in America's fastest growing league. 2018 MLS Super Draft, the Columbus Crew, Columbus Crew SC select from the University of Virginia and member of Generation Adidas, midfielder Edward Apoku. Francis Etiahene and Edward Apoku will add to the already established Ghanaian presence in the league. Etiahene has gone to FC Dallas. Opoku will add to a strong Ghanaian presence at Columbus Crew, where there are four other Ghanaian players, including the established duo of Jonathan Mensah and Harrison Afo. There's also David Akam, who has switched from Chicago Fire to Philadelphia Union, and Latif Blessing, who is now on the books of Los Angeles after spending a season at Sporting Kansas City. While many of those players joined the MLS as established names, Echia Hine and Opoku are the product of a deliberate scheme to mix academics with sports in much the same way that Lala Sabubakaria Colombo's crew did. And with salaries that many of the players admit they won't earn in Europe, it seems it won't be long before a lot more Ghanaians eye the Major League Soccer. So Africa has hosted the World Cup once, but Morocco are aiming to become the only second African country to host the World Cup after it launched its campaign for the 2026 World Cup in Casablanca. The North African nation are bidding for the fifth time and face competition from a joint bid proposed by Canada, Mexico and the USA. The decision on who will host the event will be made on June 13 at a day before the 2018 FIFA World Cup. Morocco will be hoping to be the 
fifth time lacking, having failed in 1994, 1998, 2006, and 2010. And that's all the sports here on Midday Live. My name is Anako Jaffe. Thanks very much for watching. Always a pleasure serving you. Business News is up next. Stay with us. And in business this afternoon, the governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, says the proposed measure of ADB and NIB into a new development bank as of now remains an intention of government. He says nothing has been communicated to the central bank about plans to make it a reality. The Minister of Finance, Ken Oforiata, in the 2018 budget statement indicated that government is working to merge the Agricultural Development Bank, ADB, and the National Investment Bank, NIB, to create a national development bank. Government hopes to raise some $500 million to help recapitalize the development bank to finance its industrialization and agric agenda. At the Monetary Policy Conference, the media inquired of the governor on progress made regarding the merger of the two banks and if the private ownership in ADB will affect it. I don't know where you are getting that from. To the best of my knowledge, it is still an intention. I'm not sure if they have even formally written to the supervision department to indicate that they want to uh, merge as, as a single bank. Banking consultant Dr. Richmond Etuahini says it is important for the governor to tread cautiously on the subject as if there is any move it will be coming from the Ministry of Finance. I'm sure by June or maybe September a policy statement would have come what NIB on ADB will have to be. Because I'm not sure government would like to recapitalize the two banks and, and at the same time leave it to be run like that. So I'm sure people are preparing a paper on it to tell us but the governor had to not to come in at all and wait until a sector minister comes in with a policy statement that's why he had to tread cautiously on the resignation of the second deputy governor dr johnson isiama from his post the governor dr addison had this to say i have been known to have been saying that for the first time uh, the bank of ghana had three governors who were all from within Right, so I was quite proud to have all three governors coming from the research department when I was a director in the research department. So I'm the last one who would do anything, you know, to make a deputy governor feel uncomfortable. Okay, now, secondly, the government is yet to nominate the replacement of the second deputy governor. Let's go for some entertainment news now. And on entertainment, Christian Morgan is entreating all talented children with special needs not to miss out on the opportunity to realize their dreams by auditioning for this year's Talented Kids. Morgan, a runner-up in the 2017 edition of Talented Kids, recently released a music video for a single, Ibu Bronkosia. During the show in 2017, he captured the audience, moved the judges, and won the heart of the nation. Growing up in a society where persons with disability are at a disadvantage was a difficult one for Christian. He therefore hails talented kids as the power behind his early breakthrough. He, however, admits there's still more work to be done for him to be successful in the entertainment industry. This year, I will feature Kenata. This year, I will feature Kenata and Nero X. I am hoping Shatawale will come on board as well. In August 2017, Christian dropped his debut single, Ebubron Kusia, and on World Disability Day on December 3, he released the video. Just for your girl, 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 just for your
The young artist, who has become a poster child for advocating for issues on disability, believes he has set a precedence for children with special needs to follow. Morgan is therefore urging all children with special needs to attend in their numbers the audition for the 2018 edition of TV3's Talented Kids. This year, Talented Kids is a nine. I am urging all of you to go for the audition. It shall be well. That is how I came out it last year. By God's grace, you can be first. Yes, demons have a We defest. Christian Morgan, who is currently without a music manager, aims to use his newfound fame to create awareness on glaucoma, an eye disease which cost him his sight. With support from an NGO, Spread Love Home and Abroad, the focus of the campaign will be on early and regular eye screening for children. I love them. Well, so if you would want to occupy Christian Morgan's position, well, Talented Kids Train will start and uh, you would want to tune into TV3 to get the dates as well as the regions where it will be held. Now, to some more entertainment and legendary South African jazz trumpeter, anti-apartheid activist Hugh Masakela passed on Tuesday morning at the age of 78. Co-founder, leader of Ghanaian Afro-pop band Osibisa, Teddy Osei, has been eulogizing the iconic trumpeter. Boom, shake, shake it. If you call a woman African, no man, no, 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 The world, and especially the music fraternity, woke up to a bad news. Legendary South African jazz trumpeter and saxophonist Hugh Masekela has died. And the world over, everybody is mourning him. We are drained by one of Africa's greatest saxophonists. He is a co-founder of legendary group Osibisa, Teddy Ose, and he's also saddened by this very development. It hasn't been easy for me at all. It's, 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 it's so sad, man. You know, I, I've, it, it's, it's been a prominent, very prominent African. All his songs are my favorite, especially Gracie in the Grass. You're saying it was big in the U.S.? Very big. Very big. It was a big hit. That put me across what, what, what he is, you know, at a very long, uh, young age. Even when he was in America, Right, he was all the time working towards freedom for South Africa, you know, and uh, uh, it's a, a big thing for for South Africa to have got him to talk about South Africa uh, in, in his live music. Anytime he's on stage, he's talking about South Africa and the freedom and everything. Very, very big loss. You met him in 1962, and. He played so many gigs, but how would you describe him? For me, he was a, 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 a great friend, um, a very famous uh, a trumpeter. He, he put uh, Africa on the on the world map for jazz, and I regard him very highly. You know, because when you talk about an African in, in jazz, he, he was there. So. Uh, I say it's a big loss, but then, you know, we all have to go sometime. But uh, it's, it's a pity he has, he has to go now. His legacy lives on. To some international news, uh, the head of Congo's Catholic Church has condemned the government of President Joseph Kabila for a deadly crackdown on pro-democracy protesters suggesting his country was becoming like a prison. Cardinal Laurent Musengo has been ratcheting up a conflict between the government and one of the Democratic Republic of Congo's most powerful institutions as the church increasingly becomes a focal point of opposition to Kabila's efforts to stay in power with no mandate.
And that's our wrap up on Midday Live this afternoon. There's more news updates on our website. It's 3news.com. You can visit there for more. And also, let's stay interactive on our social media platforms. TV2 Ghana, Facebook and Twitter. My name is Nanikia Minsar Do enjoy your lunch. <laughs>